Hello Anglophonians, yes, it's this time of the year when everything is calming down. Yes, and we're coming to a close somehow. Hmm. Ah, yeah. Oh, you want some something from me? Yes, <laughs> of course. What can we do? Well, as I try to make these episodes something special, we are doing something special this time. Well, I've talked about several adventures of Asterix. Well, of course, when something is famous, you have to do more with it. For example, comics can turn into movies, animated movies, for example, and Asterix was no exception in that behalf. Yes, and um, as early as the 1960s, there were some animated adventures, and some of them are, well, how do I put it? Remarkable, very remarkable. So let's take a look at what I want to call the first phase of the animated Asterix movies, shall we? Now, the history of the Asterix movies is a bit twisted, but first, where are we in the timeline? The last adventure of Asterix we've seen in this series was Asterix and the Banquet, which was published in 1965. While this book was being published, work was already underway on the first film, Asterix the Goal. It was released in 1967, but it's not that simple. First of all, you have to take into account that Asterix was published almost continuously at the time, meaning that as soon as one adventure was finished in Pilot magazine, the next one appeared. This was particularly noticeable in the 1960s. In 1966, no fewer than three adventures of the Little Gold were published. No wonder publisher Dargo was keen to bring Asterix to the big screen. And this is the point where the problems began. Let's take a look at the first film. The film Asterix the Goal begins with a very interesting opening credits in which we are introduced to the goals of the small village. First, there is a white sheet of paper and the respective figure is drawn as if by magic. So, if we see the drawing process closely here, then the inventors of Asterix, René Gossini and Albert Udasso, will surely have worked on the film. No. What does that mean, no? It seems unbelievable, but the film studio Bell Vision, which produced the film, secretly worked on the film at the behest of the publisher. Gossini and Udasso were not in the know. They were presented with a finished result. Maybe the publisher hoped that they would be so excited that they would simply give their approval. Especially since, by the time this film was finished, the next one was already in the works, Asterix and the Golden Sickle. To put it this way, Gossini and Uderso were a bit underwhelmed. They then gave their consent to publish Asterix the Goal, but they stopped work on Asterix and the Golden Sickle. Not only that, everything that had already been produced for the film, drawings, cells and film material, had to be destroyed. Dargo gave in as not to mess with his successful authors. As far as we know today, no film footage of the Golden Sickle exists. Only a few cells have survived. If you compare it, Asterix the goal is 68 minutes long, the Golden Sickle would have been the same length. But why this strange length? Even back then, films were around 90 minutes long. However, there were initially no plans to show Asterix films in cinemas. It was supposed to be a television production. You can see that in the film. 
and that's one of the reasons why Gossini and Oderso weren't enthusiastic about the work. It's a simple production and is reminiscent of the early Tintin adventures also made by Bell Vision. Although the plot of the film follows the original very faithfully, the details are not well done. For example, here you can see the goals in the background, which are very generic and seem to be from time to time just copies of Asterix and Obelix. In this scene we see Julius Caesar with dark hair, even though he actually has white hair. And when characters walk, you usually just see them from the side while the background moves. This had the advantage that you could use the same cells several times in a row for the character's walking movements. What's more, the film didn't take advantage of its medium. However, the strength of a film adaptation is that you can do things in the film that are not possible in a comic, because you cannot, for example, depict them in a drawing. The scenes in which the Gauls beat up the Romans, for example, are so quick that you can barely see what's actually happening and before you know it, they are over again. There is another problem with the English version of the film. The film was released before Asterix comic books even existed in English. The first volume, Asterix the Goal, was not published in English until 1969. Therefore, the names of the goals in the English version of the film do not match what they would later have in the translated comics. The druid Gedefix was addressed with his original French name Panoramics, Vital Statistics is named Tonne Bricks and Cacophonics the Bard is named Stop the Musics. Something similar happened in the German version, although Asterix was already known here. The names were changed to make them more child-friendly funny. The Gallic chief Vercingetorix, for example, who laid down his arms before Caesar, was called Haudraufinix, which can roughly translate it as hit it like nothing. The helper of the centurion Phonus Bolonus, Marcus Sauerpus, was called Marcus Schmalzlocus. In English, roughly Marcus Greasy Lock of Hair. And an ass stuck to the end. Yeah, child-friendly funny. Ha ha, all the fun we have. That's actually very sad, because Asterix had already proven at that point that you don't have to make humor too childish so that everyone likes it. In any case, after this production, all plans for further films were put on hold and Gossini and Uderzo insisted on being involved in further films. One final piece of information, the director who produced the film was Ray Gossens, the same one who made the first Tintin series for Bell Vision. For the second film it was decided not to follow the order of the comic books, but to take a theme that would promise success. Therefore the adventure Asterix and Cleopatra, published in 1965, was to be made into a film, which was also very popular as a comic book. As already mentioned, Gossini and Uderzo insisted on being involved in the production and a man was brought in who would accompany Asterix's film career for a while. The French screenwriter Pierre Chernia. We also see a significant increase in quality. The backgrounds and animations are better developed. The plot remains close to the original but they now dare to deviate from it in favor of the possibilities that the film offers. And since Disney films were very popular at the time and were staged as musicals, this was also done with Asterix and Cleopatra. Yes, you heard me correctly. Asterix and Cleopatra is a musical. While bathing, Cleopatra sings about how she is bathing. Obelix gets to sing about how he likes to eat and the film's villains get their own song about how they are poisoning a cake to frame the goals. Additional gags for the film medium include the role of Cleopatra's lion, which already behaves unusually in the comics and becomes completely anthropomorphic in the film. He walks on two legs and sings along to the scene with Cleopatra's bath. In a pyramid, Obelix discovers a relief depicting Santa Claus and Caesar's spy has the ability to completely blend into the background. 
As already mentioned, the rest of the plot of the film follows that of the comic, so I won't go into that until it's the turn of Asterix and Cleopatra. Instead, I would like to focus on the third Asterix film, which is worth a closer look. This film can be considered the conclusion of the first trilogy of Asterix films. And oh yes, what a conclusion that is. It starts with the fact that only a year has passed between the first and the second Asterix films, but fans have now had to wait eight years. The second thing to note is that this film was not produced by Bellvision, but by the Edefix studio, founded by Gossini and Uderso. The third thing I have to say is that this film doesn't follow a comic book template, but rather tells its own story. It makes even greater use of the possibilities of the film medium, is full of slapstick and breaks the fourth wall several times. That's why the film received mixed reviews when it was released in theaters, but it has since become a classic. Many fans even consider it to be the best Asterix film. And with that I have to issue a warning. Spoilers beyond this point. If you haven't seen the film yet, but you like Asterix, I strongly advise you to watch the film before continuing to watch this video. You will not regret it. If you continue to watch, I will mention a few key points of the plot. So you have been warned. And first I have to say, Take a look at these pictures. Someone invented the phrase, every frame a painting, and it really applies here. This is high quality animation. In later years, Udasso liked to bow to Walt Disney, calling him the great druid. But when I see that, I have to say, you bow to no one. But what is the plot? The Romans are becoming more and more frustrated when it comes to the Gauls. They cannot defeat them and a centurion concludes that they must be gods. Caesar doesn't think this is good at all. And his advisors are also of the opinion that nothing can be done against the gods. This gives Caesar an idea. Like Hercules, he will give the Gauls 12 tasks that only gods can do. If the Gauls complete the 12 tasks, he will surrender. Asterix and Obelix are chosen for these tasks because Asterix is the smartest and Obelix is the strongest in the village. Caius Titlus, who has Caesar's trust and is incorruptible, oversees the competition. And in order not to let this get too out of hand, here are the 12 tasks that Asterix and Obelix have to face. They have to defeat the marathon runner Asbestos, an Olympian in the running. They have to defeat the German Cylindric in Judo. They have to defeat the Persian Versus in javelin throwing. They have to resist the sirens on the island of pleasure. Hmm. They have to resist the gaze of Iris, the Egyptian magician, who can put anyone into hypnosis. They have to eat everything that Mannequin picks, the Titan's chef, puts in front of them. They have to cross the Cave of the Beast, from which no one has yet returned. They have to get a permission form from the place that sends you mad. They have to cross a gorge on an invisible rope, at the bottom of which flows a river with crocodiles. They have to answer a riddle question from the old man of the mountain. They have to spend the night in a field haunted by ghosts. The final task takes them to Rome, where they meet their friends from the village. In the circus, they first face gladiators than wild animals. Now of course Asterix and Obelix have solved the 11 previous tasks and with the help of their friends they transform the actually bloody circus performance into something that corresponds to a modern circus with tricks and tamers and such. So they have completed Caesar's tasks. And what does the Emperor do? He demands silence. He then explains that the goals have solved all the tasks. They must therefore be gods. And he surrenders and gives the future of the Roman Empire into the hands of the goals. Wow, that was an ending I didn't expect. 
but that's what makes the film so extraordinary. It goes a little further, we find out that Caesar lives in a country house, takes care of flowers and has Cleopatra cook for him. Caius Titlus is allowed to choose his own reward and goes to the sirens on the island of pleasure. Lucky guy. And, <clears throat> and the goals celebrate with their usual feast. The end. The end? No, not really. Obelix asks Asterix whether this is all true and whether they are now the masters of Rome. Asterix replies that this is a film and in a film anything is possible. And Obelix then disappears to the island of pleasure with his roast wild boar. And now the film is over. Oh, Obelix. Lucky guy. Wait, 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 wait. This, this is also some sort of film here. Does that mean I can do anything what I want? Like going, going to the island of pleasure? Let's try. Yeah. <coughs> 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 No, obviously not everything is possible here. Ah, okay, I think I have to stick here and tell you my conclusions, right? In fact, The Twelve Tasks of Asterix is also my favorite film of the series, even though there were a few more that came after it. The film is full of wordplay and little things that you might only notice on the second or third viewing. For example, in the scene in the field with the ghosts, Asterix asks the ghost if it actually knows what time it is. Asterix is tired and wants to sleep. When asking, Asterix taps his wrist with his index finger, which of course is an anachronism. Asterix points to the place where one normally wears a wristwatch, an invention that of course did not yet exist in 50 BC. Or in the opening sequence, we see all the goals gathered together and the narrator says that they are so well known that he doesn't even have to introduce them anymore. And he then asks if anyone doesn't know the characters yet, whereupon dark shadows appear as if the cinema audience had jumped up to show that not everyone knows them. The goals react to this with sad faces. In this scene with Native Americans, in the background we see a character that Gosini and Udaso created for another comic series, Umpapa. And if you want to know how Native Americans get into a film set in Europe in 50 BC, you have to watch the film. Really. You see, I could go on like this forever. The first trilogy of Asterix films shows a nice development, both in the drawing style and in the way the films are made. Asterix the goal was produced quickly and doesn't take too much liberties, while in Asterix and Cleopatra both the pictures and the implementation of the plot are much better for the film medium. This culminates in the 12 tasks of Asterix. Actually a good position to move on from. And what happened? Well, first of all, nothing. The Edifix studio continued to produce films for Lucky Luke before it closed again in 1978. We didn't hear anything more about Asterix in the cinema until 1985, almost 10 years after the last movie. And as the saying goes, the world had become a different place. The Asterix films also changed accordingly. But this is another story and will be told another time. So there you have it. These were the first Asterix animated movies. Yes, and today is a very special evening. Because when I now say my uh, usual final words, it means the next time will be in the next year. And I hope that you all have a good transition into the next year. And that we meet again safe and healthy and see you.